Well, this is a proper documentary. Some people, some filmmakers do proper documentaries. Others, yeah. Just saying. Hi guys, this is a, a song that I actually recorded for the sea zombie scene in one of John Flagg's films. Yeah, I'm going to get from China. Yeah. Well, the goggles are here. fantastic singer isn't she she's uh, had some really really good hits yeah. in the past but let's face it they went with the with the better choice the better um, actress yeah i've got an amazing adventure with my magic biscuits it's um yeah it's one of the um i think it's um become one of them rare films like it's um it'd probably be like a retro thing now to try and get hold of yeah, yeah. it'd be uh, it'd be <laughs> That'll go over a lot of people's heads, but never mind. <laughs> diva. Yeah, I think he thought you were a little bit of a diva. No, I had absolutely no idea where he would have got that, that sort of thing from. You can soup out of a bowl. It's very embarrassing. Mm. Eccentric, eccentric, yes. I bet definitely. it was embarrassing, yes. yes. Couldn't have coped with that. <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant, that is. Can we uh, review the footage from the sand dunes, please? Yes, sir? certainly. Okay. Oh, stop, stop, stop. Bloody Carl Jackson there, he's wearing his glasses. Look, got his bloody glasses on. And what's this over here? You've got over the Welsh village in the back of them. It's supposed to be bloody Egypt, for Christ's sake. John Flagg passed away in April 2022. A prolific filmmaker, a legend, a myth. But who was he? Did he even exist? Or was he merely a front for films that the makers had decided to disown? Our story starts in 1944 with John Smith being born to parents Florence and Isaiah Smith. Florence ran a family grocery store in Whitmarines, Wolverhampton. 
Isaiah was stationed in Egypt during the war. His friends often commented that his name came about because one eye was higher than the other. Coming from a theatrical background helped, as he was stationed with the same squadron as Mescaline the Magician, who famously made Cairo disappear from the Nazis. After the war, the family toured with the Hollywood Lookalike show, which featured lookalikes of Charlie Chaplin, Laurel and Hardy and Carmen Miranda. Young John was fascinated with actors, but equally had a fondness for cinema and early television. He may have appeared in Carol Levis's Discoveries, although this can't be verified. John's family had an 8mm projector and his favourites were old comedies, Abbott and Costello, monster films and the 1920s serials, particularly Flash Gordon. Through a friend of Isaiah's, John got a job as a tea boy at Oakwood Studios in Teddington Lock, Twickenham. Sticking close to the filmmakers, young John learned the art of filmmaking from the ground up. The first film he worked on was on the lost 1960s plasticine film, Minicore Force, helping to model the set and stop motion figures. Apparently the film was based on Buck Rogers. During this documentary, we spoke to John's brother Phil. Here he takes up the story. So Phil, what was it like growing up with John Flagg? Well, John's 20 years older than me. So, you know, it wasn't easy. I'm, as the baby of the family, yeah. I would have thought I was, you know, going to be favoured, body coddled. Yeah. Wasn't like that at all. John, he basically was the golden boy, the, the apple in everybody's eye. Yeah. Uh, Mum and Dad said, oh, he's going to break Hollywood. He's going to be this famous director. So I grew up under his shadow. Mm, okay. So did, did you get on with him? Or, you know, was it a bit? To begin with, I was a little bit jealous, I think, uh, because there was so much attention paid to him. I, I felt a bit pushed out. But, uh, yeah, and with the big age gap, obviously, he was probably more of a, a yeah. father-son relationship, we, was it? We didn't get close. We no. didn't get that. Not, not to begin with, we didn't get close, no. No, okay. It's difficult to know how many films he worked on, as some went uncredited, and most of the films and all of the paper records were destroyed in a studio fire, caused by unstable and badly stored film elements. Perhaps never in peacetime has Britain known such a fire as this, summed by the evening outbreak in Cheapside Street in the Anderston Dockside area. Explosive stuff. And as increasing flames roared 200 feet above the rooftops, the question was, could the fire be contained? Tragedy came as the brigades fought the inferno. A terrific explosion buried several firemen beneath a wall. Dawn revealed the extent of the disaster. Three fire appliances were destroyed. One a 17,000 pound new fire engine. As we receive these pictures, it is reported that at least 19 fire and salvage men perished in the blaze, while damage may reach 10 million pounds. In the afternoon, Princess Margaret interrupted her program to visit the scene of the blaze. Like all who saw it, she was appalled. Here in the space of a few hours occurred human tragedy. Her Royal Highness expressed deep sympathy with the relatives of the men who died in this terrible fire. From recollections of actors and staff, we think he worked on The Adventures of Sir Niti, The Red Demon and A Woman Scorned but we don't know in what capacity. Oakwood did pastiches of everything from carry-on films to James Bond, TV shows and horror movies. We do know that he worked on the following Oakwood films though, mainly as a cameraman, and these were catalogued by the BFI. In 1961, he worked on Cop Out, a tough police drama which had terrible dialogue, such as, "'Tis the thing Agatha Crispy never found." It was released in America as Butterball and Hopscotch, who were the two main characters. Nineteen sixty one also saw the release of The Keeper of the Lost Idol. 
This was a cross between Alan Quatermain and Tarzan and featured the dialogue, Greetings, I am Orbly Dorby, Guider of Guides and Keeper of Lou Skoda. And it's the lost idol of straight cut, crinkly cut chips. In 1962, he worked on Z-Force. This was his first foray into superhero filmmaking. 1963 saw the release of Rumble and Frankfurt, a comedy police film with the overlong dialogue sequence of Anyway, I know something you don't know. No, you don't. How could you? Yes, I do. Well, I know it anyway. Prove it. No, because if I say it, then you'll repeat it. And then you'll say you knew it anyway. No, I don't. No, I won't. Etc, etc. 1964 was the turn of Zim Saladbin. An Arabian adventure. John's brother remembers it well. Seen here in an interview we did with him. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, when I was born, John was already in the film industry. He, uh, he was working as an apprentice uh, with... Uh, oh, what is it? I can't remember the company. But, um, yeah, he put me in his movies. Uh, uh, when, I, when I was eight, I remember he took me on a set of... Um, bin... Uh, sorry, Zim Salad Bin. Okay. Yeah, I, I know, I know. But I got to uh, try on my first turban. Nice. And uh, I experienced the magic of the special effects where we got a fine carpet. Oh, nice. Yeah, oh, it was so crap. Oh, <laughs> so crap. Did it actually fly there, the carpet? No. Okay. No, not at all. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh. <laughs> Oh dear, oh sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Right, so you started off as an, as an actress and then later you were in continuity in John Fagg's films, I believe. Yes, I did a lot of acting in uh, films and I was really good at the time. Um, and everybody used to love watching them as well and uh, seeing me and I was meeting up with them after the shows and everything. It was really yeah. good. Excellent. So your first film as a child actor was in the Zim Salad Bin in 1964. Oh, yes. I can't really remember that far back because I was only very young then. But mm. I do remember flying carpet. Yeah. Excellent. Well, what about this for a bit of Oh, wow. Gosh, yes. We found... How have you got your hands on that? Ah, well, we have our little ways and means. I just remember the, the box and the colours on the, yeah. on the front. Yeah, isn't it because amazing? It reminds you of a carpet. Yeah. <laughs> I've got all the old names on the back, obviously. You oh, wow. on the back, Sophie, Sophie Javanka. Gosh. And some of the old amazing little names. See? Okay. Isn't it good? I often wondered where that went to. Uh, I can't remember who gave it me. I know it's one of the other actors. Just oh. gave it me, lent it me, so, so it's mm. got to go back. Hopefully I can remember who it is. I'm sure I've written it down somewhere. 1964 also saw the release of The Found Dudes. This was a vampire film that featured the soundtrack You Bloody Thief, You Stole My Record. In 1966, Who's That Gardener was released. This was a carry-on rip-off about a firm of gardeners. In 1967, it was Stick to Your Guns, a Western film, filmed in a Welsh suburban bungalow. This featured the dialogue, I'm going to shoe shine your ass, Marshall. Film also remembers it well. I was a child at the beginning of the Western uh, Stick to Your Guns, okay. I think it was called. 1968 saw two more films, Bunko and Pip, his second foray into superhero films, followed by The Last Chance Saloon, another Western drama that commented on Vietnam. 1968 was a prolific year. A scripted but never made was Flobbing Blood, a parody of Robin Hood. These films also suffered an odd fate, where the 8mm film warped and snapped in some cases. Some were repaired so much that they lost their soundtracks. Film stock ended up being reused to make cement and now a part of motorway bridges. And in one case, a cameraman walked off with the only footage. The films featured lots of car chases in an old Ford Anglia and later the Escort and often featured music from the TV series Peter Gunn. 
or speeded up rock music. Some films had comedy outtakes before they were fashionable to use up the end of the 8 mil reel before it could be developed. While filming in Wales, Flag was drawn to the coast and its castles, in particular Harlech and surrounding areas, a place he would revisit several times throughout his career, and we will visit there ourselves in due course. Many of the early films featured original music performed by jazz quartet The Magic Trombone Set, Sadly, they were not available to comment. Many of the films also featured the same actors. These actors in the early films included Carl Jackson, Carl Carberetta, Cara Mellenby, aka Sophie Javanka, Carl Datson, Tarquin Fanbelt, John Ability, Craig Austin, aka Simon Sigma, and Paige Turner. Most of these actors would go on to work with Flag and his own production company when he left Oakwood. Except for one actor, he had an upset tummy on the set due to sitting in the cold. His mother told him he couldn't work with him again. We were lucky enough to interview some of these actors, who have their own recollections on the films and indeed Flag himself. We also spoke with the late Carl Jackson's son. So uh, I believe your dad was in one of the films called uh, Cop Out in 1961. That was a police drama. And uh, so that's probably where his love of car chases and all his car names came from, I think. I mean, he was he was a car guy, so it yeah. was ingrained within him, really. Yeah, a bit of an enthusiast. Oh, yes, to say the least. Yeah, a bit, well, unlike John Flagg, who's a bit eccentric. But, yeah, yeah. Mm, we won't go there just yet. <laughs> 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 so, we uh, your dad was also in uh, Keeper of the Lost Idol in 1961. Yes. And uh, tell me a little bit more about that. What do you think that was about? Well, according to my dad, yeah, it was the precursor to Indiana Jones. Ah, okay. He swears blindly by it. Well, he yeah. swore blindly by yeah. it. And, uh, yeah, that's the way he was. Yeah. You know, he, he really thought that that idea came first. Actually. Okay, but unfortunately <laughs> we can't really uh, prove this, can we? Because not many of the films existed. No. Or do exist anymore. Yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that these films are no longer with us. Yeah, some of them uh, seem to be uh, cementing motorway bridges now. Because that's what happened to a lot of cut scenes and a lot of films that got destroyed, I believe. A lot, yeah. Yeah. So the uh, next film your dad appeared in was an Arabian film, I believe, in 1964 called, get ready for this, Zim Saladbin. Yeah, I uh, certainly remember that one. Mm. Uh, he used to literally sneak into the kitchen and would take towels because they could not afford to have actual, you know, head, you know, head scarves or anything like that. Okay, very nice. Mum was not happy with him. <laughs> Nice. Okay. So, do you know if he ever appeared in any of the horror films of the 1970s, like Flesh Crawl, for example? Yes, I believe that. I believe that was one of his favourite films that he, that he filmed. Yeah. He really enjoyed it. Do you remember anything about that? Or did he tell you anything about it at all? Uh, not really. Uh, no. Uh, you're too young, I suppose, to really. I wasn't really allowed to kind of be there for those kind of films. No, and. Do you know if he appeared in any of the uh, Cheeky Cherry films? Not that I know of. I mean, he did do things that we don't know of. Okay. But I think he did not go with, you know, he didn't go to those kind of films. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay. So I believe his last film was The Antichrist of Monte Cristo in 1981. <laughs> That'll go over a lot of people's heads, but never mind. <laughs> <have to> <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have any photos of your dad with John Flagg? No, surprisingly, no. We no. never really had any photos with him. That's a shame because I've asked, you know, off camera, I've asked a few people if they've got any pictures of John Flagg, and nobody seemed to have any pictures of him. Oh. Seems very elusive and very strange. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So, do you have any pictures of your dad at all in any films? I mean, I have, 
have uh, oh, let's have a look. maybe one or two. Not the most flattering uh, pictures of him. Okay. But uh, I don't think he'll mind at all. Right, here we go. Where is it? Right, we have this one. Little cheeky chappy. <laughs> as uh, James Bond, as he likes to oh, be called. Yeah. That was that cop out then. Uh, yes, it was, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like I said, he really just, I think he just enjoyed being in that suit, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you'll guess straight away which film this was in. Yeah, the Zim Salad bin. That was, unfortunately, <laughs> my mum's favourite towel that he ruined. Oh, dearly me. And here he is with a friend. I really, really don't know what his name is. He, he didn't really tell me much about him. No? No. And I finally have that one. Pointing the gun, so yeah, I've got written down here. Could be stick to your guns, so I've got a few, few of the old films. So yeah, um, yeah. We'll, okay. take, we'll take a punt at that yeah. one, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Stab in the dark. Towards the end of the nineteen sixties, John set up his own production company, Doctor X Films, which were made in conjunction and mainly in house at Oakwood. Others were filmed on location, particularly at the aforementioned Harlick. It was also around this time that John Smith changed his name to John Flagg for reasons unknown. <laughs> 